So it's Easter Sunday. Not sure what we should talk about. <laughs> no, I was uh, sharing with Wayne, a friend here, that's like, this is the 15th time, you know, doing a, an Easter message. And, you know, there is that question of like, what's, obviously we know the topic. But sometimes that familiarity can breed a little bit of, of uh, you know, kind of a, a glossy eyed, just what am I? What am I doing again on this Sunday? What am I celebrating? And just in that human weakness that we have, it's are we really open and hungry for something fresh? And so I was just even that's just asking the Lord, what's what aspect of that glorious news of Easter are are you wanting to to share with our church family this morning? And it's just so neat how God speaks and He's faithful because I just sat down kind of a, a blank canvas with if you will, other than saying, Oh, I know we're talking about Easter. And it just felt like the Lord was just, bam, here it is. And so I'm, I'm believing. I've got a fire in my belly, believing that this is not just a, a, an Easter message, but that the living, resurrected Lord Jesus, by his spirit, is, is hovering in this place. And he's wanting to bring resurrection power into your life today. And so as you listen, I just want to encourage you and challenge you that this is not just information, but you're, we're coming as, as children all of us before God, as Jesus said, be childlike. We're coming as children, ready to receive, believing that the resurrected king is wanting to resurrect me a little more today. And, that, and that's it right there, is that his resurrection power was not just for him, but the glorious news that we by faith are grabbing hold of is that it's for each one of us, that he wants to resurrect us. And so just, just listen, be listening for ultimately the Holy Spirit what part of your life is he wanting to resurrect today by his resurrection power so we're looking at really one of the most unique events in human history there's really no one else who's claimed or proved <laughs> that they have power over sin and death and hell I mean you can go to all the religions in the world and kind of interesting nobody else even tries to claim that one I wonder why What was Jesus doing on the cross and in the resurrection? I want to take us to Colossians and Ephesians. This is probably an angle that we don't often look at, and that's maybe where the Lord is just encouraging us to keep our hearts humble and listening to a good, an aspect of the good news of the resurrection. Colossians 2.15. Speaking of the power of what Jesus was doing on the cross and in the resurrection... Paul says this about Jesus, that he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing, triumphing over them. Now, at, at first reading, it's a quick little verse, and you know we can pass over it. It's easy. There's so much in the Bible, right? And it's just like sometimes those little phrases, you just pass over things. And, and maybe even as you read this, it's, Oh, he disarmed the rulers and authorities. They're talking about, you know, Pontius Pilate and, and Jesus proved he was more powerful than him as he rose from the dead. While all that's true, that's not what he's talking about at all. This is about the spiritual collision. The behind the scenes, behind the veil of just the, the, the normal life that we see here into the reality that the spirit realm is bigger and, and more real and eternal, way more significant than even what we see in front of us and can touch. Paul's talking about the, the spiritual power collision that took place, the greatest clash of titans ever, if you will. Those, that word ruler and authorities is the same exact phrase where Paul says it in Ephesians 6.12, this, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, same exact words in the Greek. These are the cosmic powers over this present darkness that we see. They are the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places or in the spirit realm. So when Paul says that he's disarming the rulers and authorities, he's talking about the spiritual battle, the spiritual forces of evil that exist in the world that are behind the evil that takes place. 
And so with that context, there's a couple beautiful phrases. It says that Jesus, in that cosmic clash against the spiritual evil that's in the world, he simply disarmed them. And that word disarmed is a beautiful one. It's powerful. It means it's a twofold. It's he just took away their weapons by force. <laughs> took away their weapons and, and the picture is and stripped them naked. Just, just completely humiliated them. Just took everything they have. When the power collision took place, there, there was no real battle. As we just saying, you have no rival. I mean, a collision took place, but it wasn't even close. Jesus just took away their weapons and stripped them naked. And he goes on to say, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Now, this is where we can just quickly read over it and, oh, that's kind of cool, but, oh, man, we're missing the context of, of the culture. There is a very specific Greco-Roman cultural reference here in this very word of triumphing. It's very specific. It's intentional. And if you're, if you're not familiar with the context, this is the time where first the, you know, the Greeks with Alexander the Great and then the Romans had taken over all of the known world at the time through bloody conquest. And so this, they're living, and Paul's actually writing under prison house arrest under Roman rule. He's a Roman prisoner while writing this book to the people of Colossae. And, and Ephesus. And so in that context of the Roman rule, where there's been these series of, you know, conquering generals and war heroes, there was this very specific picture that Paul wants to paint. That word, that triumphing, that was used very specifically in that day and age to describe the victorious conquering general who would triumph over them. And essentially, it's this word that describes how the leader, the victorious war hero, would parade the captives through the main street in order, as after disarming them and stripping them and proving their authority over them. And they would parade them through the street, kind of, Return as this conquering war hero, but saying, look what I've done. Look what I've done for you. Look how powerful I am. This is, this is all that's left of our enemy. I have conquered them. They are now stripped, and they are bloody, and they're being dragged through the streets as a victory lap. And this happened multiple times in Greek and Roman history. And Paul says, Jesus took that victory lap with Satan being dragged behind him in the street, bloodied, defeated, and saying, look who I've triumphed over. I love the message translation where it says of this verse that Jesus stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and he marched them naked through the streets. Jesus had a parade on resurrection day and he's inviting us to join him I mean when you think of these warriors that come through the streets what's the natural response of the crowd is to cheer I mean if, if it's true that the general has you know liberated them from their captives or conquered a new land what's the response of the people it's to cheer it's to be wow it's, just, it's to somehow say hey I, I want to be a part of that team I want to share in that victory. I want your victory to become my victory, right? And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He has paraded the enemy through the streets, and that is an invitation to faith in him as the conquering hero, where he's saying, by faith, come and taste, partake. My victory becomes your victory. And I have gifts that I want to share with you. I have the spoils of war, in fact. Paul makes that explicitly clear with the same image of the triumphal Jesus, but he adds this picture of the spoils of war in Ephesians 4, 8, right here, where it says, when Jesus ascended on high, 
He led a host of captives. So what is that? That's the same exact picture. That's that Greco-Roman picture of the victorious, conquering hero who is leading a host of captives. The defeated foe is being dragged in the streets in humiliation. Jesus is putting him to shame, saying, I have no rivals. It wasn't even close. But more than that, he's saying, and he gave gifts to humanity. This is the picture of the victorious warrior dragging the defeated woe through the, foe through the streets and saying, I have the spoils of war that I want to pass out to my people. I have pillaged the enemy. And that's good news for you because it means gifts to pass out. So this is a very Greco-Roman picture, but Paul's saying this is exactly, he's speaking the language of the people, but I like it. It's a good picture. It's a mighty Jesus. It's a ferocious Jesus. It's warrior Jesus. I mean, you, let's imagine here this, uh, this word ascended is so beautiful. This is not talking about the ascension that those 80s movies of Jesus just do a horrible job depicting where he kind of like floats away like a little ghost. You guys remember those, eight, you know, Jesus movies? I, I love them, but that part's terrible, where it's just like Jesus kind of like, and he like kind of disappears. I mean, the, you know, whatever. The technology wasn't there. But that's, that's, it wasn't a glorious ascension. That's not, though, this is what Jesus is, is being referred to here. This, this word ascend is this picture of rising up, coming up. When Jesus rose up, what was he doing? What happened? And so a picture came to my mind as I was preparing this. This is like you can imagine in the spirit realm, Jesus ascending, leading captives, passing out gifts. This is him. He's rising up from death, hell, and the grave in victory, in power. He's just in, in full glory. Show, and, and, and he's got a chain in his hand. And to that chain is attached the, the defeated foe, Satan, who he's just dragging with him up from the grave just to prove in a public spectacle, look, he doesn't have to win anymore in your life. He is a defeated foe. He is now chained. He's the one who is defeated and, and doesn't have to live in victory anymore. And to prove it, as he keeps rise, rising up, he shows us and look, these are the spoils of war. I have pillaged hell for you. I have taken back what the enemy has stolen. And in my victory, I want to give it back to you. I want to give you that new identity that the enemy had stolen. And say, no, beloved child of God. I want to give back that forgiveness that you didn't think was possible. That me, I could be holy and blameless before God in Christ. No matter what I have done, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was enough. And it just keeps going and going, this invitation of Jesus for what he wants to pass out as the spoils of war that he's pillaged from hell. How about deliverance from the lies of the enemy that keep us paralyzed in fear? How about the healing for your body that's needed? How about your life having clear purpose and passion that gets you up every morning with a fire in your belly? How about the light and easy yoke that Jesus himself speaks of that he says he has and he, wanna, he wants to pass it on to all of us so that we can live like a kid in God's kingdom? How about the joy unshakable that Jesus has and he wants to give it to us even in the middle of the storms? One of his last words with his disciples is, my joy I want to give to you. How about the hope that you can have where you thought, no, nah, those days are gone. I can't wake up with that kind of hope anymore. That ship has sailed. Jesus says, I ripped that out of hell for you. The, the devil stole it, and I've got it back, and I'm the source. Do you want it? How about just a life where the, the impossible becomes increasingly possible, where we actually live 
in a faith of Jesus where like Jesus said, even about us, not even what God wanted to do, but what God will do in us and through us where Jesus said, anyone who believes in me will do the miraculous works that I do. Now, none of us are there yet, so what do we do? Close the door and say, well, I guess Jesus was not telling the truth. Or do we say, man, I've got a lot more to know, to learn, to grow, where the impossible or what I thought was impossible bows to the power of Jesus. I want to receive that good gift. All of these things, this is part of that kingdom of God, that shalom, that eternal life that begins now with Jesus, where Jesus is saying, I went through hell and back to purchase these for you. These are the spoils of my war. Do you want them? And which posture honors the king's sacrifice better? Is it one that just says, you know, well, I, I see all of these things that you did, Jesus, but, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm comfortable right here in my status quo. I, I, I don't want to ask too much of you. I got heaven when I die. Eh, it's good enough. Or is it the posture where you see all these beautiful gifts that Jesus fought the powers of hell for, gave his own life, proved his power and dominion over them, made a public spectacle of them, beat them up, dragged them through the streets and says, and I have spoils of war. Does it not honor him to say, so I want everything that you died on the cross for. If you sacrificed your life for it, I want it, good king. And just to go with that, that humble hunger, it doesn't dishonor God to say, man, I am hungry and expectant to see more of your resurrection power in me. That honors him and everything that he fought for and died for and resurrected for. He didn't go through hell just to make a little difference in our life. He went through hell and back so that heaven could transform every aspect of our life. So to honor the king, to honor the victorious resurrected king is to hunger for more of his resurrection power in me, in you, in your family. So the resurrection power of Jesus, I believe, is a call for us to be hungry in life, to push the limits of what we know is possible. Push the limits. More of your resurrection power. I know you're not done with me yet, you're not done with me yet because the Bible says my destiny is to become transformed into the likeness of Christ. Well, I'm not Jesus yet, so you're not done with me yet. So let's push the limits more of your resurrected power. What area of my life am I not yet seeing resurrection power? That's, that's not bad news. That's good news. It means Jesus is not done and you've got resurrection power coming if we seek it. Listen to this, some of these things that Paul says. It's just so intense. that they, they give me a, a confidence that we're supposed to think like this in, as Christians. Push the limits of possible because it honors the resurrected king to see more of his resurrection in me. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we even ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be the glory forever and ever according to the power at work what kind of power resurrection power we're gonna see more than a moment but you, that's such a hyperbolic statement of paul to him who's able to do more than you can even imagine or think abundantly more we either dismiss that and say nah god's not that powerful or man i've got a lot more growing to do I want to walk a life where I can look back and say, God was so powerful there, I, I didn't even think that was possible. And that that becomes your increasing story. This is not meant to be a hypothetical. Like, well, God is able to do more than, abundantly more than you ask or think, but not for you. Because he likes that guy over there better. This is not supposed to be hypothetical for any of us. This is supposed to be that invitation to resurrection power. More of that resurrection power in me. That power at work within us, 
that he speaks of, what is it? Let's look at it a little bit more. He prays for that. Same exact phrase in Ephesians 1.19. Paul prays for them that they would experience, encounter, because it's not information alone, it's an encounter with the living God. He prays for them that they would experience that power at work within them that he's speaking of. And what does that look like? This is what he prays, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. That they would experience what is the e- immeasurable greatness of his power <laughs> toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked, listen to this, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So what power is at work in us that Paul has in mind, that he prays we would experience more and more? First of all, it's a power of immeasurable greatness. The the greatness of the power available coming our way cannot even be measured I mean if that's not a call to to humbly be hungry to push the limits of possible when you combine that with Ephesians 3 20 that he wants to do abundantly more than you can even ask or think I mean it's wow that's a vision for our life never settle in the status quo why because the best is yet to come and it can always get better with Jesus because none of us are Jesus. None of us are fully transformed to be like him. So he's saying, come on, get hungry. Stay hungry. And then he goes on to say that we would experience this power. So specifically, what is that power? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at, his, at, the, at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. In other words, that power that's at work in us that he's talking about is the same power that was at work, literally what it says, in Christ to raise him from the dead and seat him on the throne in heaven. Are we, are we catching that? That same power, that resurrection power is in us the same one that rose Christ from the dead and seated him victoriously in heaven. So as beloved children of God, Christ's victory has become our victory. That is a great truth to own. Even though we haven't yet fully walked in it and in this life we never will, Christ's victory has become our victory. He's got the spoils of war. Say, come on, grab hold of it. It's for you. I bought it for you. The resurrecting king is resurrecting me. To wake up every day with that as a declaration, that is God's will. I can own that. That is God's will for every day that I wake up, no matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on. The resurrected king wants to resurrect me. That's everything we've looked at. You can own that. And that's, that's something that can get us out of bed every morning. It says, I do not accept the status quo. I'm never stuck. Why? Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him on the throne in heaven is right here. In, on, around. I don't know exactly where. Everywhere. Sometimes I'm like, I got to grab hold of it. Where are you? That's the life of following Jesus. These are huge claims by God's word. Huge. Claims of our inheritance in Christ. That's the point. They're supposed to call us, push the limits of possible. Truly following Jesus will be the most wonderful, life-giving, rising from the dead, adventurous, transformative, powerful kingdom fruit experience that anyone anywhere in life could ever possibly offer it's way better there is no rival no one went through death hell and pillaged it all and says i got heaven that i want to pass out on a daily basis so just keep following me 
That power of the resurrection is the call to push the limits of what we know to be possible. And now I want to just bring it back down into reality of just, this is just a daily walk. And for all of us, the, the challenge this morning, I believe, to bring before the risen Jesus is just that, that very honest, childlike question of where do you need to see resurrection in your life? Where do you know that the, the limits of your power have, have come to an end and they're not good enough to bring the, the transformation that you need? to bear that fruit in your life that you know you long for. You've read enough of God's word to know you're, you're made for, but you also feel like, I can't do this. And that's a great place to be because that's where God says, I can. <laughs> you're not supposed to. You didn't go through hell and pillage hell for you. I did. So be a child. Join me, follow me, and let me show you the power of resurrection. And then there's also that, that, that little more kind of cutting edge of, okay, you can also ask, and God, where do you want me to push the limits of possible so that I'm not just staying comfortable in a status quo that's far below the full resurrection power of Jesus living through me? It's way better for me, and it gives you glory. So where can I push those limits? I believe one of those questions is, is a place where God wants to meet you today. And let me just give one just down-home, nitty-gritty, practical example, because this is just going to start taking place in your life in the most nitty-gritty ways. In your hopes, in your fears, in where you're stuck in that life of, of God that you dream for, you see in God's Word, that fruit of the Spirit, of the love and the joy and the peace and the power and the, the healing the deliverance, the freedom. It's going to happen in you, in your family, in your work setting, in everyday life. So let me just tell just one story of this week as an example of how I love how gracious God is to push the limits of possible. So something that my wonderful wife has been doing regularly with really all of our kids since they were little is, is trying to push the limits of possible in the area of just hearing God's beautiful voice. Believing that as, as kids, that doesn't mean you have a junior Holy Spirit or you can't really commune with God or hear God's voice until you're an adult. In fact, the Bible specifically says opposite. <laughs> Be childlike to inherit the kingdom. And in Acts 2, where it says the Holy Spirit's poured out on the old and the young, and the young will have visions and dreams, right? Right? Well, that's not our reality. So what do we do? We just, well, I guess that's for someone else. <laughs> or do we say, let's push the limits of possible. We're not there, but it's not our power anyway. So <laughs> what does it look like? So she's done a great job just believing the word of God and saying, hey, let's practice. And so it looks for those opportune times to what... Let's practice hearing God's voice and hearing his heart and feeling his love. And he's that God who dances over us and sings over us and is, is, is way better than any parent in wanting to just give good gifts to his children. His heart is so full of that warm love. And so he starts you know, teaching from that young age. And let's listen. What is God saying? What do you feel God doing right now? And, and so it's an ongoing thing, but this, just this week, a couple days ago, a few days ago. So practicing with our little guy, nine, Paxton. And, and, and he picks up just randomly picks up my guitar and it's on the shelf because I tried and, and there's no resurrection power there for me. <laughs> I tried a couple times hard. Oh, that's the thorn in my flesh, right? <laughs> so stop it. That's bad theology. No, but I have no rhythm. Okay. I'm focusing on all the other things right now. So the Lord's going to resurrect that at some point in my life, but it's on the shelf right now and I'm okay. Anyways, that's a status quo. Look, I just gave it, gave it up, up to the enemy. Um, anyways, Paxton picks it up, and he just starts playing. He's having fun. You know, he's nine. Never, you know, touched the guitar. Just, poof. And, and my wife from the other room's like, whoa, like, something's happening. Like, he heaven's here. And I mean, he, and he's just banging. But she, she's feeling, believing the Holy Spirit, like, 
She's feeling God's presence. And, and, and so she goes in there and she's like, whoa, Paxton, I really, I, I feel like heaven just open and smiling and over you and, and, and wow. And, and she's like, do you, do you know, what, what do you see? What do you feel? What do you sense? And so, and he shares and they just share this beautiful moment. And I don't remember all of the details of exactly what he saw, but it was just this sense of that he's, he's feeling the pleasure of God and God's love. And he feels the power of God. And he's this little guy. It's almost like not a surprise because it's like, he's a guy for even a couple years, Christian radio. And, and now we're looking back and I was like, whoa, like that's just an area that God's just wired him to thrive. Cause he would, little songs on the radio. Afterwards, he would critique them, not on the music, but he'd be like, wow, that, that, that song's got a lot of, got a lot of like the, the power in it, huh, dad? And then another one would be like, oh, that song's not very powerful. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's, he's not critiquing the music. It's like, he's, he's feeling like the, the heaven, the presence of God. And so they had this beautiful little exchange there and it's like, wow. And so she's blessing him saying, wow, I think God may have, have been showing you Paxton that like he, through, through the music that you play, there's going to be power of heaven. And then here's the specific that I want to focus on. She felt like she had a picture of what, a tomahawk. And, and that was related to him, that God was saying, and that's highly esteemed in our family, the, the tomahawks and the Native Americans. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to lie to people and tell them I was a quarter Cherokee because I was like, whoa, there's something so powerful and awesome. And so she got this picture of, of a tomahawk and said, I feel like, you know, this is, this is for you, Paxton, that God has, has, has made you to be this, this powerful worshiper that, that, that just, like a warrior, breaks off things in people, this anointing. And it, it, to release heaven in worship and then there was a sense of like a double and she talked to me later about it I was like whoa I saw this tomahawk and, and I felt like there was this like double breaker anointing on Paxton as he sings and is like and he was just like ah, just all, all into it and I was like wow that's that's pushing the limits for me of what's possible he's nine tomahawks come on so this is where the Lord knows to, to, to humble those of big faith, right? So like two days later, I walk into Paxton's room as soon as I wake up and I look on the ceiling and shining <laughs> is this image that may or may not appear on the screen. That's the ceiling. That's the ceiling. I don't know about you, but to me, those look like tomahawks. <laughs> Double. Double breaker anointing. Let's get a little close up on that, a little closer. That's the ceiling. That is a reflection of light coming from somewhere. We've lived in that house five years. We have never seen anything like that. Waking up every day. And, and right after God gives my wife a vision of a double breaker anointing of tomahawks for our nine-year-old, I walk into his room and on the ceiling is an incredibly clear picture of two tomahawks. Five years in the house, never seen anything like that. Never seen anything on the ceiling, frankly. Pushing the limits of possible. What's, what's the takeaway? God's good? I don't know. <laughs> like, he's real. He's present. He's powerful. He's really, really good. Even with me, I'm like, tomahawks. Eh, hey, cool. No, he's like, no, tomahawks. <laughs> Remember this one. It's significant. And I need that. And you know what? He's so gracious to say, hey, Casey, you need this one. Yeah, what, what? It's just Jesus. That's not in a way like, that's not special. That's, that's just God. That's just Jesus pushing the limits of possible. Just saying, I want the more of the resurrection power of how personal, how real, how good, how awesome I am. I just want that to become your normal. So that you say, awesome, that's just you. And then there's another Hunger that says, well, what's the next normal? What's the next impossible? What did I think was impossible before? You know, flashing tomahawks on the ceiling. Oh, that's just normal now. God, what's your next level of possible? 
Could I, could I go out into the streets and confidently say, God, right now, would you give me a word for that person that you love, that is your treasure? Would you show me some of your heart for them right now? Or would you put healing in my hands? Would you help me just have a sense of where they're at in their life so that they can know the personal, powerful, present reality of the Lord Jesus who sees them as his treasures? Or what's next? I mean, who knows? Just more of Jesus. That's all I know. That's all I can promise. More of Jesus becoming real. More of the resurrection power. And Him living in you. It's just one step at a time. That's just this week. I don't know what Jesus has for you this week. But it's good news. To pursue Him with that boundary, possible pushing hunger. It says, I believe your resurrection power is wanting to resurrect me. Let's, let's pray right now. I want you to ask you to close your eyes just between you and the Lord. We're going to have a little time to listen. I, I'm going to ask my wife to pray a blessing over us, a word. But for now, in this moment, we just want to ask you to just to sit quiet, just between you and God. I almost pretend there's no one else in the room. As a, as a beloved child come before him and just ask or he's asking you where do you need to see resurrection in your life or where can you push the limits of possible and expect more resurrection power in your life Holy Spirit we ask that you would lead each and every heart in this place into what it is that you want to say you the risen Lord Jesus the good news that you have for your beloved people today. I just felt like I saw a picture of the Lord and he was seated at a beautiful king's table, his table. And he's saying, come and dine with me. Come and feast with me. Come and feast with him on the spread that he has laid before us. The impossible is possible. And I feel like he's inviting us to ask the Holy Spirit as we have to search our hearts and to search our own hearts and to see if there's something that we've been holding on to that we have either been withholding from partnering with him to see his breakthrough in unintentionally or intentionally. Sometimes it's just by accident. It's because you've been pursuing for so long and then you let go because of a place of disappointment or it's just been so long. Sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes it's just unaware because it's just an area where God wants to speak to you and bring new life breath of life, breath of heaven, his words, his fire. And so God, we just thank you. We lay these things before you in a fire of worship. We take your hand now. And we just say, yes, the impossible is possible. And we won't let go until we see the full birthing process. To some of you, you pursued breakthrough in an area for so long and you didn't see it yet. And there may be a place of hopelessness. But what he's saying is, things were happening. Just like when the angel was released, when Daniel prayed and he didn't see him for what, 21 days. But the angel said, I was released as soon as you started praying. There was a battle. There, was a, there has been a birthing process of heaven happening on earth that began the day you took the Lord's hand to see that transformation, to see that breakthrough. And when you, pick, when you take his hand again, and say yes in that area, it just continues. But it actually continues now with greater interest because nothing is lost in the kingdom. 
nothing is forsaken. Everything that he purchased for you is still purchased and is yours. And so as you take his hand again, look in his eyes, look at that smile, look at those eyes, look at that father who loves you so much that his eyes are filled with tears as he beams with joy and looks at your face. Let him fill your heart with his love and fill your eyes and your heart, fill them up with hope for glory because his word says, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. So Lord, we take your hands, we take your hand, we look into your eyes. Help us to take your hand and to look into your eyes all throughout the day, every week, all 365 days a year, and that we would know and count on resurrection power as you transform us from one degree of glory to another that we would never give up or throw something out or throw away hope when we've only seen one degree and not the full 360 yet because your promise is heaven on earth that you purchased that for us and as we hold your hand and look into your eyes we expect because you've promised we expect glory. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let us spin. Let us spin in the one degree of glory every day. One, two, three, four, five degrees, 360 degrees, total transformation in Jesus' name, because it's all that he purchased for us. It's all that he purchased for us. He purchased all of heaven. He disarmed all all of hell to bring all of his goodness to earth in your life. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your resurrection power and all that you purchased us for us. Keep our eyes on your eyes. Keep our heart on your heart that we may be filled with hope to walk this dance of life, holding your hand and beholding your transformation power from one degree of glory to another, daily, moment by moment. The impossible is possible because you are our King and Father. Thank you, Jesus. Dance a new dance like David